Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the January 2020. It's a new decade, a new year. Welcome to the January 2020 edition of Streaming Media Advance Forum, or SMAF for short. And as always, you're with Dom Robinson, myself, uh, one of the uh, numerous hosts who uh, will guide you through the next hour of slightly random and uh, amusing, but nonetheless informative conversations all about the streaming technology industry. I should hopefully be joined in the virtual studio by my erstwhile colleague, Tim Siglin. Tim, are you out there? I am out here, Dom. Can you uh, hear me and see me? I can indeed. You've got a great picture this 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 time around. Just checking in. Thank you. And um, apparently we're sponsored by National Geographic here. Of course. My, uh, my map is... <laughs> Everyone knows um, normally I sit slightly forward, but I rearranged the dining room to get my Christmas tree, which is now officially a Christmas tree, out of the dining room. And it turns out now my over the shoulder shot is the bottom of the giant map that I have on the dining room wall. Perfect. So, how was your uh, boxing day? Boxing day? Do you do boxing day in the States? No, 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 I'm just trying to be culturally me, relevant yeah. when That's I ask really you a question. Yeah, Boxing Day being great celebration. He's just, he's just trying to make you feel comfortable, then. <laughs> it's the, uh, it's the um, Boxing Day is the celebrated day or for the cat, isn't it? Because cats love boxes. So uh, it's the most looked forward to day in the year for, for our cats. We left loads of boxes out. The cats sat in them and then uh, did what cats do and puked all over them. So we've uh, put them outside. But, yeah, Christmas is great. <laughs> How was yours, Tim? <laughs> uh, actually, quite, quite, quite well. I got, um, I will have to find it because I'm really bad. I got the geekiest gift of all this year. It's one of the old Casio calculator watches. And it turns out they're less expensive now than they were when they first came out when I was 14 years old in 1984. The funny thing is I can't stand watches. I wore it for about two days, and now I take it off and put it on occasionally just to feel like, I don't know, like I'm back to the future or something like that. So. You need to like sa like Santa well, finally you answered your letter? Yeah. <laughs> From 84. Well, that, that's why you do it, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, in, in the time of Florida, really apparently I had contact flow mail that it would keep running out of postage, so I finally put a forever stamp on it, and that's why he got it, so... We're getting a little bit of an echo from you, but how was your... There we go. Uh, how was your... Uh, short and sweet. I'm still in the process of, of changing every aspect of my life. So Christmas was uh, a welcome uh, 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 holiday, and uh, there wasn't much uh, uh, circ uh, pomp and circumstance on my end. It was really... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, uh, a chance to be with family, so and that was about it. Yeah, you you need that. Right exactly. Yeah, and next the next Christmas will, will be amazing. Be expensive, and then they go up in price <laughs> for years. <laughs> next year you can get away yeah, with it. Pretty next much, year you can get away with it. They'll just pretty go much. away and give them a bottle of milk. Happy, but. The year after, oof, you're going to have to paint that beard. You're going to have to paint that beard white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So what's everyone? Well, doing Mark, since I'm, on, Tim, I was going to say, real quick, since I'm getting married, we were joking before you came on to the beginning of the show that now that my Christmas tree, you know, now that I'm getting married, I'm moving into a house that already has two Christmas trees. I've been told I either need to get rid of my Christmas tree or it becomes the Star Wars tree. So if you want an extra one, you can just let me know. Dom offered to uh, send me his, but getting it across the pond would be a little painful, I think. As I said in the warm-up, what, we, what we'll do is we'll get out yeah, of time to fake a returns label to you, and I'll return it unwanted, an entire Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move on to our guests, let me ask you. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to get away with Go ahead, Mark. No, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just continuing on the tree theme. I was going to say, I, I don't think I'll be able to get away with an artificial tree anymore. So you can have mine as well. And that could be the, the Star Wars tree. It's a it's a silver tinsel tree. It'll be perfect for life day, right? My grandparents had one of those. And I have been trying to talk Michelle into the idea of that. And I've not been successful. So let, let me talk to her first, and then we'll see. Um, I want to mention something on it. Okay, you let me know. 
about Amazon real quick before we move on to our guests. So, Dom, you're talking about the Prime return label. <clears throat> I received a package from Amazon the other day. It was in their blue bubble wrap, which is for their smaller units or, or smaller things they ship. <clears throat> I picked it up, and it was incredibly light, and I couldn't figure out why. It turns out there was nothing in the sealed package at all. I was supposed to be receiving a dongle for a computer. So I sent a return request. They gave me the option of putting it in an Amazon locker. I put it in an Amazon locker. But of course, they told me I had to open it and put the return label in the package. Um, so what I ended up doing is taking another Amazon box, putting the return label in there, writing on it. The package is still unopened. It's empty. <clears throat> And it's now been in process for the last two and a half weeks because Amazon keeps telling me they haven't received the product that I ordered from them when indeed they've received the empty, um, still sealed package. This is. I don't, I this sounds like Amazon trying to compete with Apple. With with Apple, you know, you've got AirPods, Apple Mac Air. You've got. You know, they're just sending, literally sending you air now. The yeah, it was pretty product. expensive, pretty expensive <laughs> air to ship to me, and especially, you know, I'm not really crazy about smog-filled city air. I'd, I'd like country air if they're going to send it to me. One bag like. full of air. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, it, it, it reminds me a bit of Douglas Adams, um, not the Hitchhiker's Guide, but his Dirk Gently Detective Agency, where there was this snafu that they couldn't figure out, and they ultimately ended up cutting a uh living room sofa in half maybe we'll just have to open the bag and see what happens from here so anyway on that happy note um uh lexi how was your christmas and introduce yourself actually while we, while we uh, go through this part yeah hi everyone i'm lexi nauer formerly lexi pike so my holiday was awesome we did our first joint christmas with both of our families yeah it was really fun now that i'm lexi nauer Yay, um, and I am a product marketer at Brightcove. And Brightcove is, I'm sure, hopefully you're all familiar, but they're an online video platform. We do everything from encoding all the way to app development and distribution. Now, do I understand that Limelight and Brightcove are both in the same office complex now? Yes, in uh, Scottsdale. So I actually, Brightcove headquarters is in Boston and I'm in the Scottsdale office. It's really fun to have our, our partners limelight in the same building. It's, That's really funny. Fun. I, the, the, the area in Scottsdale, the, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, is that the high tech area? Did I, did I hear that the reason they moved there because there are a bunch of tech companies in that area? Yeah, actually, our building's awesome. The, the Scottsdale office is beautiful. It's called Skysong, and it's actually a couple of the, the local university, Arizona State, they have um, – a bunch of buildings over there and so it's kind of a theater for the school um but it's fun there's a bunch of uh, tech companies in there mind bodies in there um we weeple uh Trent booker it's, it's a fun spot cool a lot of good tech energy our little baby silicon valley <laughs> nice nice uh mark mislinski how, how have your holidays been and um where are you these days where am I these? Where am I? I'm in. Oh, I'm in uh, Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. I've been down here since '06 and um, having fun. It was a joyous season and uh, always a time for uh, the gratitude for the year before and and expectations for the year ahead. So I always like the season because it's time to take account. Um, so I'm in Atlanta. I just started a job at Cinemedia, which is a uh, private equity. Uh, company and it's it's all those companies that Cisco bought 10 years ago thinking they needed to get in the video business and then they decided they don't need to do that and they shedded those companies so a collection of assets from uh, Scientific Atlanta from Barco from Inlet from Arroyo were all put together and it's kind of cool it's like a, it's like a startup company kind of but at the same time we've got uh, extensive footprint in the US and and also globally as well as about 600 million in revenue. So it's a very interesting situation, deep, rich culture of uh, good engineering resources and, and legacy products. So very excited to be here. And, and was the choice to put it in Atlanta because Scientific uh, Atlanta was just sort of so dominant in the, the video portfolio as opposed to putting it out in Silicon Valley? Well, 
Well, it's a lot of different places right now. I, I'm trying to think if we have offices on the West Coast, but I'm actually in the old scientific Atlanta complex, and um, my commute's a whole seven minutes, which is not bad at all. And um, so this is where Cisco had um, Scientific Atlanta housed and, and some assets that they sold off to Technicolor. They're also in the same complex, but across the way. And um, so this just happens to be one office of, of many they have. I think the headquarters is formally in the UK. We also got um, extensive resources in Kortrijk, Belgium, of which I was just there the week before last. And um, so it's a very interesting place right now, but there's there's a lot going on. It's you know we're having to fill in a lot of um, voids that happened when when they moved these companies out of Cisco, which was of course well vetted with everything you need to to run a company, and then all these voids showed up when they moved it over to a private equity firm. And so there's still some rebuilding going on. But like I said, it it, it feels like a startup, and I kind of like that because it's more than just traditional. Uh, building product and selling product. It feels like building a company again. So it's very interesting. Thanks. Very good. Could I, could I only make no 2020s that a, a 600 million, 4,000 person company could be described in any way as a startup? <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> I, I, I hear you, but we have the luxury of, of startup in, in making some new products and um, and the way the industry is, right? It's it's just very opportunistic right now, and then we're in a good position to go after it. Nice. nice. Okay, speaking of the industry, um, one of the topics that got posted on the flipboard made a bit of noise at the end of last year was Twitch is being sued for $3 billion. Twitch obviously was a company that Amazon acquired for over a billion dollars a couple of years ago. Um, Dom or Mark East, especially since it seems like Twitch is sort of an esports focused company. What's the what's the deal here? Why are we uh, why are we doing this? So what's what's happened is uh, is a, a group called the Rambler Group had exclusive distribution rights in Russia uh, for Premiership games, and uh, some people were illegally restreaming uh, the football games on Twitch. Uh, which was essentially a leak in the exclusivity of the rights in Russia. And uh, so the Rambler Group are suing Twitch for $3 billion, um, which I'm surprised it hasn't made more news because that's such a, I mean, I, I was going to use, possibly flippantly use the word frivolous. I think that's a bit of a frivolous claim, to be honest. Three, no, nobody loses $3 billion through watching a football game because if they did, then... 52 times a year somebody would be making three billion dollars so that's completely insane um but hey what where, where does reality come when it comes to a courtroom these days i have no idea but uh i i it's it's um i think it's uh i think it's an interesting test case if nothing else i mean um what, what do you guys think do you think this is uh this is frivolous or do you think this is just uh, somebody <laughs> slamming down the law <laughs> I think it's interesting that. Well, do you feel like Twitch. that's why it's maybe yeah. not getting so much coverage? Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Lexi. Yeah. That's okay. I think you have a bit of a. Like, I was just going to say, I agree. I think that's why it's not getting so much coverage. Obviously, Twitch is the biggest fish to go after, but I think it's interesting the onus is on them. I know at Brightco, we spend a lot of effort and resources in making sure that things don't get streamed to Reddit or Twitch or streaming platforms like that through token authentication and and other DRM focus matters. But yeah, I, I don't think Twitch should be on No, I mean, the evidence given in the article is just, just crazy. They're, they're talking about 36,000. They, they, they provided screenshots that were evidence that 36,000 viewers watched the game. So A, screenshots. They screenshot a lot of games there. And they, they are, I mean, to actually have screenshots, I'm guessing that they were themselves the pirates. So, so, so <laughs> that seems a bit challenging to me. Um, and uh, and how? For, I mean, I can't do the math in my head, but it looks like it's about a million pound a viewer there, which is really rather an expensive subscription um, for anyone. I mean, you know, I don't pay for any football. I never would, but, well, but I, I certainly wouldn't pay a million pound a game. That's crazy. Well, this this, <laughs> this crazy. is what's striking fear in 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 the big guns, right? Whether you're a Disney or Netflix or otherwise, and and I know for 
the markets that I'm tending to, which include the big direct-to-consumer companies that we all don't want to talk about right now, as well as the major broadcasters and what they're going to be doing with ATSC 3.0. But DRM, if not the first set of questions from them, is the second set of questions from them. They just absolutely positively need to see a solid DRM strategy and something that meets the strength that they're requiring uh, before they'll go much further in the conversations. It's got to be even more compli- complicated, though, because around the uh, beginning of December, Ru- uh, Russia was, uh, Runet was doing tests of di- di- disconnecting uh, Russia's access to the DNS, the, the traditional mm-hmm. IANA run DNS networks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, there we go. Ian Knox just popped in the chat room. Uh, hi, Ian. Happy New Year. Uh, popped in the chat room and highlighted that it, BT are paying £6.3 million pounds per game. But, but that's not per viewer. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really impressive if it's per viewer. Um, but, you know, if, if Runet are going to obfuscate what they're doing with their DNS mapping, that's going to make any geo-blocking and DRM mapping within Russia mm. even more complicated. So I, I, I just don't know where this is going to go, really. I think... Um, I, 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 I think it, it, this almost leaps into the next subject that we were we were we were going to talk about, which is the more g- general issue of the resurgence of piracy. Um, and, I, and I think we what, what what I what I feel is happening is that the music industry is a good bellwether, and that happened between 2000 and 2010, to, you know, the first decade. We saw a bunch of companies try to create walled garden online music services when drm first appeared warner went off and got itself a drm license everyone got they couldn't really run them people were felt they bought music but actually discovered they'd licensed it and there was a whole war there so everyone got angry and went over to lime lime wire and uh and bit torrent and so on and uh oh and, yeah yeah and, and and that 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 then was only resolved when itunes and spotify emerged and went affordable music easy to access let's just make this uh let, let's just go you know, let's just make this easy. And in the same way, ten years, you know, a decade later, Netflix really solved the online streaming video thing and got content going. And piracy dropped to a minimum in 2014, 2015. And then, as the competition's resurging and everyone's trying to wall their gardens up and cut away from everyone and get these sort of exclusive content deals, we're seeing more and more discussion about the resurgence of piracy. So, uh, I, I, yeah, piracy and competitive markets are kind of. Um, uh, they're, they're a bit of a, a, a complement to each other, really, I think. Yeah. I, 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 sorry, go ahead, Lexi, and then I just had a quick yeah. comment on that. I was, I was going to say, I really appreciate the, the audio analogy. I think Spotify was very clever in offering an ad-supported model, made it more accessible and something like traditional radio, where it's free to everyone with the, the cost of advertisement. And I think we're going to see a lot more AVOD services pop up in a response to piracy resurgence. The only problem is it's the, the long-form content, like long movies, that I don't think the ad tolerance is really there. So I think that's where we'll continue to see piracy, yeah. and we'll have to maybe solve for it in a different way, maybe sponsored content, native advertising, something like that. Yeah, something needs to be done, I think. Sorry, Tim, you were going to say something? Yeah, yeah I was yeah. going to say, I think one of the things that's interesting when you talk about the music analogy is, um, you know, I, I look back at Windows Media Audio, where they they chose to turn their DRM off licenses off and there was this huge outcry. They, they thought hardly anybody was using the service, but it turned out people were returning and returning to the same content. So they ultimately had to show consumers how to burn the audio to CDs and then re-rip it into something like iTunes, which first of all, I thought was really ironic that they were yeah. doing that after they'd spent all that money on trying to you know, keep piracy down. But the second thing, the, the piece to me that, that I think the music industry is now starting to follow the video industry is in this exclusivity model. So Spotify, iTunes, Tidal, or, or sorry, Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, you know, will will have content exclusive for seven to ten days on their service. We don't see the same kind of piracy happening there, though. It doesn't seem like people say, I'm going to absolutely figure out how to pirate you know, to listen to this album in, in the first seven to 10 days, it seems like they're content to wait for that exclusive content to hit their video stream or their audio streaming service. I guess my question is in video streaming services, the exclusivity 
tends to be around original content. And Mark Mislinski, you, you had a thought about that before we went on the air. And I'd, I'd be interested to sort of hear everybody's take on whether it's the fact that it's exclusive original content that's never going to go to the other streaming services that pushes up the piracy. Or if there's a model eventually down the line that after Amazon's had an Amazon original for three years, they'll make it available to Netflix, they'll make it available to Disney, et cetera. I, you know, that's a curious question. I can't quite remember the comment that I had before, but um, it's definitely the battle of original content that that's going on now. And um, I know with the things that uh, at least we're looking at where I'm working now, um, fingerprinting starting to get defeated and so we're definitely moving into a watermarking kind of world and and watermarking can be very very effective and um you know with proper return channels you can not only tell that something's being pirated but you can go right to the source of, of where it's being pirated from but um um i, I don't know i i personally think that uh, original content is going to stay tight to the vest with all at least all the big guns um for now to um to make their mark in terms of getting getting the viewers to come over and getting the viewers to stay, not just in season for one or two one or two originals that they like to watch, but stay stay um, uh, as subscribers constantly through throughout the year. But um, you know, there's going to be a whole other niche, I think, not niche, but segment to the industry other than the big guys, the the big the D, D, Disney and and Hulu and. ESPN and all that, but I think there's going to be a bunch of original content that's going to be based on uh, geography, that's going to be based on ethnicity, um, even based on what uh, particular demographics consumption patterns are, whether they're more or less um, lean into their content with their mobile or otherwise, or, or more or less lean back. And I'll bet you, Nickel, they don't push the push defeating or fighting privacy as hard in those because they want to get their content out there. They want to get identified as sources of those content. And just like I think our, our, um, our industry is a little bit lax at the tier one level for a little while for the same reasons. Now they're tightening up. I think that that second level content is going to run into the same thing where they might not be as tight on that, on the piracy at first and until they get their names out there. May have changed subjects on you there a little bit. <laughs> no, no, that's good. Uh, Mid-season uh, churn was one of the things I think you had mentioned. Or, mm -hmm. or that was sort of the original content question. Yeah, that that's a real real factor now. And just for, for what I had said earlier, that um, you know people watch a certain streaming service because their 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 favorite uh, originals in season, and then that's out of season, and they tend to remember. Oh yeah, then I have this other thing that I like a lot over on. You know, maybe they're switching from. Uh, from uh, Disney to to Prime because they have something else that's in season that, that that's one of their favorites and so over the course of a year they might switch they might switch streaming services three or four times depending on what's in season and and the and the streaming services are going to have to put up with that and they're going to have to put up with that and one of the things is not make it hard for people to disengage just like they make it not hard to re-engage you're just going to have to live with that because if you make it a pain in the butt to to leave your service then then that that becomes part of the quality of what people experience they, they they're going to go to other services and make it easy enough to disengage as it is to engage Point. And I think if I could if I could make a point, I think the ease of consumption is what's driving the piracy. So the, to the earlier point about Netflix, you know, uh, reducing the overall level of piracy in the 2014 2015 uh, time frame when SVOD really became a big thing, uh, it's because Netflix was it. And then you know Prime came and Hulu was in there somewhere. And now we've got you know, CBS All Access and Disney Plus and all these other, you know, SVOD uh, properties and people want to watch these shows, but are, you know, do they want eight different, you know, SVOD mm -hmm. subscriptions that they have to manage, uh, you know, over the course of a, of, a, of a month? And then you've got the churn factor, as you mentioned, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm only watching The Mandalorian on Disney Plus and then that, that season ends, well, why am I paying for Disney Plus anymore? So I'm gonna bail on that and maybe fire up CBS All Access so I can watch the next season of Star Trek. Uh, you know, so I think in some cases you've got people turning to, and this is another uh, piece in the, in the um, flip book, the uh, uh, I Stream It All and Jetflix, these guys who just got busted by the feds. Um, 
to you know to consume their their content, their original content, um, or they're you know going straight to BitTorrent and and using something like that. So um, yeah, I think I think that's what's driving it. Hmm. Yeah, it's amazing that, that I was just having a look at that um, that particular article, and hopefully you can see it on my camera at the moment. I don't know why it's quite so yellow, but we'll worry about that another time. Um, but yeah, there was at, what ten thousand movies, hundred eighteen thousand television episodes, and it was all. Oh, I, I actually like monthly fee. I like the one to the right. To the right, there, scientists want to spray shit into the atmosphere. I think is what the <laughs> <laughs> video is. Right. There we go. Just Sorry. So See that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, sorry. Back, back I was hand. Yeah. 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 Am I in the wrong forum? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is no. <laughs> but um, but you know, yeah, I think it's on to your point. Part, part, you know, the, the, it's that type of infrastructure. What it's uh, what that article when I first saw that. What, what it's sort of really highlighted to me was however much we sit there and ooh and ah at Disney Plus and at Netflix and all these technology platforms being rolled out, two guys in a bedroom are competing with them. So it, it, that worries me as a technical vendor into this sector. Mm, uh, that, that I mean, is competing the right word? Well, not legally competing, but you know how much of this is, is into the law and compliance and how much is into actually technically being able to deliver a service. And if these guys are being... Uh, you know, the, the, the headline of that article is the feds break up an illegal service that dwarfs Netflix and the Hulu libraries. I mean, we don't know what their consumption and their, their audience was like, I, 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 I acknowledge. But at the same time, the fact that these guys are threatening them, in, you know, concerning them enough, two, two guys in a bedroom and a server. Yeah. How much do we need CDNs with hundreds of thousands of servers and huge amounts of bandwidth and telco networks and when, when a couple of guys in the bedroom can do this? Well, I don't I don't know if it was in a bedroom and I don't know if it was a server like it doesn't really go into what their infrastructure was. I think it was probably quite quite a bit larger than that. Um, the thing that strikes me, though, is the the willful. Um, ignorance and willful negligence on their part and on the part of the viewers who were subscribing to their service who were, you know, it was probably pretty obvious to everyone that this was not on the up and up, and yet they had how, how many how many subscribers? It mentions it here. Oh, yeah. uh, it was 100,000 something, right? Yeah, certainly. It's, it was a bunch, bunch of subscribers. 200,000, 200,000. Know. 200, oh, no. Right. Yeah, all of whom, no, all of whom no, no, no. thought the names I stream it all and Jetflix were akin to, you know, Hulu and and Netflix, yeah. <laughs> and it, <laughs> it seems, you know, yeah. I mean, it, I, I want, I would love to see a survey of of those, you know, viewers. You know, did, were you aware that this was illegal? No, come on, be honest. Were you aware that this was illegal? Uh, it'd be it'd be <laughs> interesting to to, <laughs> to know that. And then on, no, to be fair. Hard, from a keyboard standpoint, if you're typing along, J and N are right next to each other. <laughs> you'd be like, oh, I, I accidentally hit Netflix instead of Netflix. And it was a really uh, good Tim, deal. So Tim, were you a subscriber? I have no. To be honest, Tim was about to say he's never subscribed to anything. I'm slightly worried about that. <laughs> honest, the J's right next to the N. Come on. Mm. No, well, and the, and I was the, gonna say, to, to be fair, those operations are pretty big, and they, they they look sophisticated. So, I mean, I think people are ignorantly pirating content. You get to those sites, it looks legit, pretty standard content, and I th I think it's I mean. So young kids and like grandparents aren't going to know when they're pirating content. I mean, I think this is, the level of sophistication is really what causes the issue. Like you said, there's 200,000 subscribers. Yeah, but I, and I don't think any of the subscribers are young kids and grandparents. I think they're all they're all savvy <laughs> savvy enough to become aware yeah. of something like I stream it all and Jetflix, and they're savvy enough to like yeah. go through the machinations of 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 you know subscribing. They're probably savvy enough to know that it's not real, you know, that it's not legal. And then you've got the, these two guys who got who got busted for both of those services. They were working for both of those services, and clearly they're savvy enough to create these these platforms and manage them and that sort of thing. So obviously, there there was a a, a decision made at some point on the part of both these guys to, you know, go forward with something that inevitably would end in a huge federal copyright case. And they were fine with that. Like, I, I have to wonder what goes through the minds of these, you know, the, of these guys who could go work for any startup. Um, and, 
you know, they, they choose to, they choose this, this road. It's, it's, uh, it's mind boggling. Well, that, yeah. that's a curious I one. It probably doesn't get as far as that, but at the bottom, the bail was paid by Mark's company. Conveniently switches to Mark. <laughs> I was just going to say, in, in defense of what Lexi said, I mean, we're in this period where content was being shown by Netflix and now has been pulled back, and and being shown by other SVODs and being pulled back. So the consumer can be easily confused that oh, this must be available on multiple platforms, or, mm-hmm. you know. So um, you know they they have no idea what a lot of what we're talking about here on on this forum, you know. And all they know is it's it's been available on Netflix now. It's available back on NBC or whatever. And so they may just be thinking, well, that, that just happens to be another outlet that's so available for this content. You know, I, I remember Akamai actually doing a study, it's probably seven, eight years ago. They had, it was either CES or NAB. They had a bunch of reporters come in and they talked to us about piracy. And one of the points that they made was people will try to find it legitimately. Um, but if it's not, and this was back in the era when, Hulu would do things like House, the TV show about the doctor. They wouldn't release it until eight days later. Um, so it would air on TV, and then they would release it eight days later. And Akamai's point was people will give it about 48 hours, and if they can't find it, and if it's going to keep them out of the water cooler conversation at work, mm-hmm. they will go find that content and look at it. And now when we've got exclusive content on these on-demand services, if you don't want to pay the 10 bucks a month, but you have a way to watch a couple episodes so you feel like you're in the know. Like, I didn't know anything about Baby Yoda until Christmas. And, <laughs> and then I got told that it wasn't even Baby Yoda, it was the child. And, you know, so I'm completely clueless on this because, it, Dom, as you say, I don't subscribe to anything. But at the end of the day, people who would want to know that, if they aren't going to get Disney Plus, they're going to figure out some way to get the content and, and see it. So I think part we of it's ignorance. We part all have of the conversation. Thing. We all have our witnesses. I didn't know anything about Instagram until two days ago, and then my daughter had a rather ageist conversation with me. So I'm now on Instagram. <laughs> okay, boomer. So, you know, we exactly. missed things, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, that but that leads into another topic we were going to talk about when when we met when we're talking about two guys in a bedroom or whatever that scenario is. I, I think we say that because that's how Mark Cuban got started. You know, with with broadcast.com but but mark mislinsky you mentioned um low latency actually making it easier for people to serve content rather than just being part of the big pdn so let's talk a little bit about sort of the state of low latency at this point well i um you know i'm just thinking about you know we're we're now having companies want to go to direct to consumer and um and just the whole competition of for eyeballs, and um, I mean, what what we've had for some time is that the the cost to go over the top has always had been its own cost because you had a separate workflow from what's been traditional cable and pay TV. So that that was slowing the deployment of direct consumer services and and streaming services in general. And uh, what would be ideal is if you could use the same two workflows to deliver both your traditional pay TV as well as your as your OTT. And um, what's been holding back the idea, let's say, using the same infrastructure as – well, let me back up for a second. So, And, and what's been used for, for over the top, that infrastructure, um, is, is extremely opportunistic. It's It works in a domain called it the HTTP domain. And um, – it's it's extremely efficient then for targeted delivery, whether that be for targeted advertising, personalized content, blackouts, um, and just rights management in general. It's, it's highly efficient, but the problem is it's always had it's always had a delay associated with it. And you know whether whether it be on um, uh, 20, 30, 40 milliseconds of delay, it, it's reading. You know it was at a threshold where people, especially watching live events and watching live sports, didn't want to put up with that kind of delay. Um, but but now um, we've we've hit this inflection point where at least the people in leading in the industry they 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 can do this over the top infrastructure with all the the conveniences of target delivery 
um, they can do it with the same amount of delay as broadcast television, down around six milliseconds. So now this opens up uh, the idea of um, a unified infrastructure available for both over-the-top and, and pay TV. Um, so that's ex accelerating the amount, the number of players that are getting in the over-the-top streaming industry and in the direct-to-consumer industry, as well as it is going to accelerate um, the ability to do um, targeted delivery, like I said, whether it be personalized content of which you can make it more particular to any one consumer that's watching it, whether it be targeted advertising of which can get higher CPMs because you know a lot more about the demographics of the people that are out there or, or, or necessary rights management. So, um, you know, we're hitting this inflection point where um, that's also accelerating just direct to consumer and personalization in general, not just for the big guys. How about you, Lotus? Yeah. Are, 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 you, are, you yeah. are you getting a big, big pull for low latency? And, and I, I couldn't. Low latency, yes and no, but really being able to translate those broadcast workflows into digital and converge the two to make it easier to, to get direct to the consumer. We spent a lot of time and effort to make read things like study markers rather than having to do digital cue points and being able to ingest. TS versus RTMP and, and being able to do those conversions to make it easier for broadcasters to go direct to consumer. Um, but in, in terms of low latency and targeted advertising, um, we're gearing up for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and scale and being able to target to that large of an audience. These are things that you have to take under consideration. Um, so we, we've looked at things like doing cohorts, so being smarter about how we handle that amount of traffic and target that many users at once. Um, so, yeah, but then you run into things like latency. Um, so if you're using multiple data centers, using multiple uh, targeting methods, uh, it, it becomes challenging. So that's going to be top of mind for us this year as we, as we gear up for the summer. Mark, Tim, any other thoughts on latency from your points of view? Me or Lexi? No, Mark, Mark East. Which Mark? Yeah. Are we going to give me a nickname? The East from the West. So, so I just just add to that. I mean, I mean, Scuddy Thirty Five is a very powerful thing, and you you can right. certainly do ad insertion, and and it could support um, targeted ad insertion. But it has certain amounts of overhead. It also has issues with pushing it through, especially OTT distribution pipes. It can get minced up. It can get um, altered. It it can and and um, there's problems with consistency of the, those markers and the use of them all the way through the OTT distribution streams. But if you go right, right to over the top and use manifest man manipulation, it's highly efficient then for, for doing ad insertion, for doing personalized television. And, um, and it doesn't, you don't have to overcome some of the, some of the challenges associated with SCT 35. So it, it just opens up a whole new world of, uh, efficiently being able to personalize television and advertising. Yeah, we're, we're really focused on exactly, SCUDI can get a little bit complicated, but being able to intelligently mm -hmm. configure a pod, make sure there's no discontinuities mm -hmm. and making sure that all the, the timing works out. It's, it's really hard, mm -hmm. especially in a, a live environment, but yeah, manifest manipulation definitely helps. Marky, what's your take? I mean, latency is something obviously that impacts esports and some of the other. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah. I think it's it's the new standard. I think low, you know, low latency is the new standard. Mm -hmm. U ULL has not quite, you know, uh, reached a an inflection point where that that has become what everyone's clamoring for. Um, but you know, if you can get within the the two to five second range, that that's akin to broadcast television. I think that's where you need to be right now, and I, I, I'm pretty sure all all live broadcasters agree on that point. Um, and that's you know perfectly. Uh, it, we're, we're perfectly capable of doing that with with you know vanilla HLS, um, as as was discussed at, at Streaming Media West. You know, I I, I don't. I don't know if we we need low latency HLS uh, right now um, for most uh, endeavors, but. Well, there well, we go. We're back in. My apologies <laughs> for that. I have no idea what happened. Sorry, Mark, you were going to say something. <laughs> we'll call that technology problems. Where, where'd you lose me? You were talking about 
the less need for ultra low latency versus low latency that the, the standard two two point five seconds is. Yeah, I, just, I mean, the, the question, yeah, the, the question was about low latency, and it's, I, I think it's table stakes at this point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've been talking about it for for a couple of years, and now it's to the point where all the CDNs have some sort of solution, uh, you know, where I'm, I'm able to get you know, anywhere from two to seven seconds on, you know, regular old vanilla Akamai HLS, and that works for me. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it works for all of our customers at this point. I, I literally have no customers who are asking for anything lower than two seconds. So, yeah. um, you know, when that becomes the, you know, the topic of conversation, then we'll address it at that point. And there are certainly, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, 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 emerging technologies that, that uh, address that need. So Dom, um, I think Mark Maslinski mentioned, you know, we, we're doing HTTP, we're doing it really well now for low latency. Um, you have, for the last 20 years, advocated for multicast and some of the reliable UDPs. Do you think we're at the point where it's time to say HTTP is the way we're going to deliver and not try to continue to advance latencies that would be uh, sub one second or what's your sort of take on that from the oh, end. No, I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that the, um, uh, so you have to, excuse me, I'll sort my camera out when I'm next off shot. My, my camera's playing up a little bit okay. here, but since that reboot, but um, the, uh, I, I'm very much of the opinion that um, the resurgence of interest in IP multicast in the last sort of six months because off the back of ATSC3 and the 5G rollouts uh, will bring back uh, and the also the reemergence of edge compute. Um, there's going to be less and less need for standardization. Um, people are very obsessed with HLS and the derivatives of that to reach specific devices because CDNs needed a commodity of scale. Um, but what's happening now is CDNs are learning how to ro roll out proper fog architecture uh, across their networks. Uh, and so if you want to have uh, a, 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 a go back to RTSP uh, running on real servers distributed in 16 nodes all over the country and have half second latency with whatever input you want, that's something that you can roll specifically for your platform at will and roll at any scale. Uh, and that's, that's something that's coming back with cloud computing. So uh, while there is a a, there will always be a, an attempt to create this sort of one ring to rule them all, the one standard to bind them. Um, uh, we're, we're moving further and further away from that than ever now with edge computing and distributed computing taking shape the way it is. The only reason that it might be relevant is in low power devices where you're trying to restrict things to a specific, specific rollout on a specific chipset in a phone. But to be honest, my phone's more powerful than my laptop these days. So uh, that, that itself is changing. And the phone itself is becoming an edge you know that's relaying data out to i to your watch that's relaying data out to other devices so um no i think i i think we i think the, the whole http thing has been an aberration a little bit like vinyl was uh and in the sort of 70s i think it, it, it's distracted people into a sort of a little bit of a myopic way of looking at content delivery uh you know people still believe that 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 um uh, that, that vinyl was in some way helping artists, uh, helping people reach audiences, but it wasn't. It was like a choke point. A, uh, 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 it was a very restrictive thing. Uh, it was a necessity because of the cost of, of, of building that type of infrastructure. And in the same way, Akamai was very efficient for them to strip away Flash and strip away Windows Media and not have several different teams running all these different protocols in their networks because it was expensive. But <laughs> ask Amazon if they'd like everybody to do one thing. Uh, and cut all their different millions. You know, Amazon launches 16 different stupidly named services every day um, and, and trying to convince Amazon to cut back what they're doing to one thing and, and say, you're only going to do low latency HLS. It's just, a, it's just totally not, not, not going to be the way forward. And I think the CDNs are going to open out and start looking like very distributed edge compute networks over the next couple of years. Some of them are. Some of them are totally myopic about HTTP. Uh, but I think those guys are going to have to correct course in, uh, at some point in the next uh, 18 months, two years. So, there you go. So that's the str strongly opinionated corner of the day. <laughs> so that's going to blur the lines then between distribution, which could now just be over the commercial clouds versus distribution over the major CDM players. That's 
It's oh, going to yeah. be how they how they handle the edge compute and the, fi the efficiency of the distribution of it and the use of it that's going to make make the difference. Do you think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no. I mean, the, the the CDNs were the first clouds for mm -hmm. sure, and then the C the clouds decided to centralize operations, and that meant that they could have more concentration of skill and they could create a greater diversity of propositions. So they then sort of went down a schism that they called public cloud, but the CDNs have, have or, you know, two decades more experience in running very, very distributed uh, comp uh, uh, elastic compute environments. The thing is, they have never made that elastic compute capability available to third parties. They've always offered uh, specific platform as a service offerings through that. So because of the economy of scale and, and maintaining it. So for Akamai, it was just much easier to run Varnish or whatever it was, Nginx everywhere uh, to do HTTP forwarding. Uh, so, oh dear, look at all these other inferior technologies, we'll just break them and let them go away. But then all those people move to public cloud, their businesses are scaling, they need to get to reach. So the CDNs that can offer proper edge compute and let people run any function as a service in the cloud deep at the edge for those niche use cases, uh, they're going to get the business and that's where the growth will be. Um, and mm. uh, so, yeah, we, we, we are going to see quite a lot. I'm, I'm pushing edge compute and CDN uh convergence or schism whichever way you want to look at the time timeline um i'm pushing that in the content delivery summit this may really hard you know there, there, there is an absolutely clear schism between uh fast the akamai cloudflare and on the other side Path and, and limelight and where they're going with their edge compute strategies and they're mm -hmm. divergent um they, they'll always offer a complementary set of everything because they don't want to turn away customers but the, the strength of belief in, um, in, in the future of HTTP is myopic in my mind in the, in the big mm. guns. And there's a big opportunity for the smaller players or the, the, the upstart players, the disruptive players at the moment. Yeah, actually, Dom, you know, I, for once, actually sort of agree with you on that. Um, I, I do think edge compute is, is going to be a defining line between what's been traditional CDNs and <clears throat> cloud computing. Uh, but do I hear you say that that if somebody wanted to stand up older technologies or different technologies and <clears throat> set up their own nodes for distribution using, using edge compute, that that would be the kind of thing that the CDN would would essentially allow? Or would, yeah. would there be a point for edge compute where they'll say, no, you can't no, you can't. I, I absolutely, can't. I absolutely think edge compute will go a fully elastic. Uh, I, I absolutely think I'll be able to walk in to uh, you know a line like a stack path, a company like that in 2025, and roll out a Windows Media CDN. Hmm. And I'll pay by the hour for the computes that I use, and it'll be deeply located. It'll probably be maybe even in the enterprise network. And, you know, at the moment today. We probably, ideas my company is probably one of the largest Windows media distributors in the world because we do all the financial news for, for all our financial clients and that's a shed load of financial announcements and they still use Windows media multicast in many, many enterprise networks around the world. Yes. Um, and we, we, we spin all the Windows media origins up in EC2 and uh, if the clients haven't got them, we, we, we have to sit down and help them set up win the old Windows boxes in which support Windows Media Multicast in the enterprise networks, and that's complex. Uh, that's complex enough for them. But at the moment, one of the CDNs can say, "Oh yeah, extend our edge compute into your enterprise." And when Don wants to spin up a Windows Media server, he can do it for you. Well, what's not to like? And that's that's the way the distribute. That's the way Fog is going. That's the way the high end of edge computing is going. Um, so, so it's an interesting combination of eCDN and CDN, as well as elastic computing as yeah. well. It's it's easy to inside out, you know. Amazon won't be able to do that. They won't be able to sit out at the edge of all the telcos because the telcos themselves don't want to give that much power to Amazon. So they're leaving them in the data centers and and dragging the access back to the data centers. But for those niche applications, particularly in in car entertainment, autonomous driving, all the drivers that are behind five G, uh, that's where edge computes going, and and it, and CDNs are just. In, in, in orders of magnitude more used to dealing with network issues than Amazon is. That's a good segue to a question then for our guests about 5G. Is it something you're hearing about? You have customers wanting to do 
or it's just the, the buzzword of the day at the moment. Mark, you <laughs> I, for me, I'd say it, it falls in the buzzword category. I think it will maybe have some implications for production um, that, that could be good in the future. But uh, from our perspective, maybe some help in some lower bandwidth areas or regions, but, but nothing huge, nothing massive. It hasn't been on the, the top of our mind. So contribution side from a production standpoint, possibly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mark? Mark sure. For sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a first mile thing, not a last mile thing for us. Yeah. And the networks ju are just aren't there yet, especially in the U.S. at this point. So, you know, it's it's buzzword for now. Yeah. Um, we'll be talking about it legitimately soon, but not right now. Well, yeah, I, I, I think 5G's, 5G's got, got, uh, uh, got, got a number of different challenges. We've got masts being upgraded in our area for 5G. And... Uh, the community's polarized about it. Um, there's there's people that think that it's going to make a difference to the speed with which they can surf the web, which is just obviously, you know, if you're a techie, you, speed of light is the speed of light, guys. It's just, that's the way it is. Right, um, exactly. And, uh, and there's video companies which are saying this is going to be a great panacea because you're going to be able to watch 8K on a one-inch screen, and that's completely pointless. I don't want to watch 8K on a 52-foot right. screen. It's just, you know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sold on 8K at all. Um, uh, but, you know, there are places where without 5G, it's going to be impossible. Uh, autonomous driving is the big, big, big driver for 5G. Smart motorways, that, that's the one. I, I actually haven't found anything else that justifies it yet. Um, it's, it, they'd do much, much better if they, if they invested in ubiquity on 4G. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in that. There's a lot of communities who haven't got any connectivity at all. Why you need to go and add five times the power consumption, five times the mass density in cities to give people who've already got more than enough bandwidth, more, more than, more than, more than enough bandwidth, I don't know. So, <clears throat> Mark Mithlinski, you were going to yeah. say something? Well, I, I just, you know, with Dom said, it's interesting that, you know, they already have gobs of bandwidth in the city. And then if you go to the sparsely populated areas, I mean, 5G, it's my understanding, you're putting towers every 300 feet. Yeah, I mean, they're just so at, at some point that's going to be impractical for certain things. Um, I also got, find it interesting that, you know, 5G's gobs of bandwidth. That's great. 5G can data cast, which is a good thing. And especially for inter Internet of Things is going to come into play. But at the same time, I'm, I'm working the side of the uh, things with ATSC 3.0 and broadcasting and ATSC 3.0 in terms of data casting is going to is going to be able to outduel i think everything including 5g for certain for certain iot models for the the, the cost per bit to data cast out with the atsc 3.0 is going to be more effective than even 5g so i, I think 5g is going to have its place and um but it might not be the wide panacea that everybody thinks it's going to be it's just my opinion at the moment i was going to say I'd, i'll add on atsc 3.0 that i I believe that, um, that that's actually got the potential to be a game changer. I wrote an article at the beginning of 2019 talking about sort of the ramp up to ATSC 3.0. And one of the things that I find interesting when you go back and look at ATSC 1.0 is that, you know, as the local broadcasters were given this particular amount of, of bandwidth and megabits per second, they turned around and actually would slice it into three to four 720p channels as opposed to one 1080p. I think if that model continues, some of the local broadcasters may begin to be able to offer on-demand content as well. Yeah. Uh, because if you've got that part of the data pipe available to you and you locally at your tower or close to your tower for that content, there's no reason to say that there couldn't be... Um, now, I mean, it may be... It may be like the early days of cable video on demand where, you know, we're going to play it at 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. But I also think there's a model they could go to, to full on demand delivery um, to consumers. And, and what does that do in terms of those affiliates of NBC or CBS being able to offer all access or Peacock as a, as a service as well across the tower? Yeah, or even as downloadable content. But but before we let go of the 5G thing, where where it could get interesting is, 
when you have 5G that you need to get out to populated areas and there's sparse, sparse, sparse use of it in between, um, ATSC 3.0 could end up being a, a backbone service to 5G to get to get out to to those other areas, and they could work together. And it could be that combination of ATSC 3.0 and 5G that could be something really special, maybe. Interesting. Um, so we've got a couple minutes here <clears throat> because we were del delayed in the middle. We'll probably run over about five minutes extra. But um, let's talk about sort of what we're going to see in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. Lexi, I'll go ahead and let you go first on that. First of all, are you going to CES? And then secondly, um, what do you expect to see in the, the 2020 time frame? So I will not be at CES, but a couple of my colleagues will. So Bright Cove will definitely have a presence and people can go meet up with them if they so choose. Um, but my 2020 predictions are they're not necessarily novel or new, but I do believe that we're going to start going back to normal traditional TV just streamed. Um, I think we will see more skinny bundles. I think it's already started to happen with Disney when you look at their bundling ESPN and Hulu and to their acquisition of Fox. It's just all going to kind of be what we have in cable. I also think, like we mentioned with piracy, to reduce with the things like we talked about, subscription fatigue, piracy, I think we're gonna really start to see an influx in ad supported models. Um, how that translates to long form, like movies and films, well, that'll be interesting. Maybe something more native or um, things with interactivity, being able to do in-app purchasing. But I, I think we'll see Skinny Bundles and AVOD. Those are my two big predictions for 2020. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. TV like the way it was. Yeah. <laughs> <in the 90s. laughs> just, just sort of a scary thing the for the 2020. Yeah. yeah. Mark Maslecki, what about you? What um, CES and then also um, what do you take for 2020? Uh, well, I'm not going to CES, which doesn't bug me at all because that show is kind of big and honor. It's hard to get things done there. I will be at NAB, of course. But um, first, I'll repeat the one thing that I said. I think the the uh, trajectories of uh, the people uh, subscribership in direct to consumer and also pay TV decline. Those those trajectories are going to go nonlinear and move much faster. So I think it's going to be an interesting year with 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 some level of inflection point showing up there. Um, second of all, I, I would concur with Dom that you know, we're going to see uh, very blurred lines between CDNs and clouds, and it's going to be the management and deployment of edge compute that's going to maybe be the competitive factor for all that. And then thirdly, um, I've always been a proponent that linear is not going to die, and I also a proponent that linear is very valuable extremely valuable. And I think maybe the golden gauntlets there, which I'll mention in a minute. But, you know, what we've seen is just the resurgence of SVOD, of binge watching, of the ability to to address um, uh, different demographics very effectively. So so I really like that. And it's all valid. But linear hasn't gotten away, gone away. I think it's just getting repackaged. I just think especially with the resurgence, not resurgence, but the, the coming of connected TVs, and and uh, with that, that that um, we're going to have um, linear is going to make a resurgence, maybe for reality TV and sports. But linear addressable advertising, I see as a big golden goblet. You know that you know you can have a broad the size of broadcast audiences, yet when it comes time for for advertising, have have linear addressable going on there. And I think that could be, you know, really push along the idea of targeted advertising and and the the promise of the revenues that that can make. Well, I definitely agree that targeted advertising is going to continue to evolve. It'll be interesting to see how that how that plays with linear, like you said. Mm -hmm. Mark East, what about you? Well, first of all, I need to say I really like the cinema verite look you've got going on, Tim. <laughs> I like the, the handheld uh, Blair Witch Project so, sort of thing. Sorry, that's, I, that's I realized one. I didn't that's have the long one. extension cord for my uh, power adapter, so I'm having to hold no, it on my knee. No, no, no. No worries. I, I'm I'm serious. I like it. Um, I'm only going to CES to catch the Ivanka Trump uh, keynote. No, no, you're not. It's pantomime. It's pantomime. So, uh, <laughs> no, I, I. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I probably won't be at CES. Um, I, I think from the from the production side of things, I think we'll. 
in 2020, it'll just be a kind of a continuation of what happened in 2019, which is this migration on the contribution side away from satellite and towards bonded LTE mm -hmm. solutions for a lot of different stuff um, and the accompanying migration away from uh, on-site production to Remy style production, um, a lot of which is being enabled with the the bonded LTE and the um, the IP enabled technologies over satellite. Um, the the switch is doing a lot of fun stuff with that. LTN is doing a lot of fun stuff with that. So um, that that side of of my business is changing quite rapidly, and um, and it's up to the legacy you know satellite based companies like PSSI and 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 those folks to kind of figure out how to keep pace and um, and uh, maintain their their revenues. So it'll be an interesting year in that space. Got it. And the headless Dominic Robinson, yeah, uh, which by the way, Michelle, I ask you where your hat is. I'm wearing uh, it at the moment. Tell her normally where I had it. My camera well, went off. I put the hat on and I haven't taken it off since, but uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, the hat's up somewhere upstairs. I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. So a uh, couple of, couple right. of, couple of, a couple of adventurous predictions. So I think um, I think the uh, battle between ESPN for Zone and Amazon is going to be quite interesting this year. Yeah. I think there is still a play to be the Netflix of sport, uh, and somebody's going to try to win that game this yeah. year, and then realise that mm -hmm. actually, as soon as there's one, then there'll probably be a, 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 a Sky Sports Plus will come in, and everyone will spend 35 conferences a year talking about who's going to whether Sky Sports Plus is going to take over from the whoever won the pre anyway, I, I I think that that uh, particular game is going to be the hot one. Amazon's obviously done its Premiership games over here in the uh, on Prime, and they seem to be. What's interesting is there isn't any news about it, um, which probably means it's working quite well, and the uh, and the. Um, uh, 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 the fans are just engaged in the games rather than bitching about bl blurry images and so on. So I think the sport, live linear sports packages will, will get their stuff together. The other one that I think is interesting, which goes back a little bit to the RuNet um, DNS trials, is uh, I, I, as you know, I did a, certainly Tim and Mark now, I did a diploma in internet policy uh, about 10 years ago and so on. So I still keep my finger on uh, the internet policy space and it's getting rough out there. Um, there's some crazies in power in every government in the world and there is still an attempt to uh, bring the internet under the ITU's auspices, uh, 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 regulatory auspices and move it away from the uh, consensus-based um, uh uh, environment that it's 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 until now grown up under the runet thing is a big warning salvo there and if that happens i think we're going to see significant balkanization probably quite quickly uh and i think it'll be much harder for for example me to get access to content from the states uh for mm. people in, in asia to get access to content you know, the internet will not look like the internet it will go back to the well it will reveal itself to be what it probably is, which is a whole myriad of collections of networks, uh, which I think will change the game for the monopolies and the startups and the way that small businesses have been able to become global players. I think it will change com competition. Uh, so I, I think we're going to see some of that starting to really strongly emerge over this year. Ooh, well, uh, balkanization is not a pretty word, but I mm. actually sort of see your point there, Dom, <clears throat> especially with RUNET and some of the things that have happened in the UN yeah. in the last couple of days with China and uh, Russia pushing this whole cybercrime thing, which essentially could I be. I think a, the internet is not Europeans and, uh, and, uh, and Americans have thought of it as a global thing is going to become more and more restricted to. Uh, territories, which is a shame, um, but uh, it only helps the tax. It only helps the tax collectors at the end of the day. Speaking of which, I want to mention one last thing before we go out. Apparently, France passed a law allowing their tax collectors to go onto social media and gather um, what they're calling anomalies, where if somebody says, "I don't have a lot of money," but they're flashing <laughs> lots of cash and standing next to the cars. Um, I, I think that monitoring model 
um, along with balkanization, is going to be something we're going to have to address here in in the early 20s. Yeah, it'd probably, so. probably be fine. It was always legal for them to do that. It's just that they're putting it into practice. It's like uh, yeah. it's like child pornography, and it's completely illegal. It doesn't need any regulation on the internet. It is just illegal in every country on the planet. It's enforcing it that's difficult, and uh, and trying to con- trying to blame it on the internet is like trying to blame it on paper. Well, we we had companies over here in the U.S. that will some of them were screening social media as part of making a decision to hire somebody. Mm. But they did anyway. They just didn't admit it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, with that lovely topic as our ending topic, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <you're> right, so. <laughs> we we're signing off here for uh, the next month. Apparently, I'm the only one going to see yes, and I didn't even know Ivanka Trump was going to keynote. So, Mark, I may have to adjust my schedule as well. But, take, um, take good notes for, for, or a rifle. Exactly. Well, what's funny is I get all the press releases from CES, you know, in, in my press email. I've seen nothing about that. Maybe they don't necessarily want to publish that one out because they know they'll get blowback or something. But mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, with that, back, uh, <laughs> strange end for the 2020 week. opener. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be back with some, you know, less heavy topics at, at the beginning. Of, I'm DJ February. If you, if you want a bit of jungle, we've got to so to get a Thursday night show in a couple of hours. So. Exactly. We'd like to thank our guests, Lexi and uh, Mark, for being with us. Thank and, you. Um, Thanks for having us. Dom and Mark East, as always, and we hope Eric gets to feeling a little better so he can get back to work and join us uh, on, on the next episode as well. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye.